how did you first become involved with the project? Yes, yeah, well, um, Jane and I had worked together 30 years previously. Mm -hmm. um, we'd met on a film called An Angel at My Table, which incidentally had just been released onto Netflix, I see. So, you know, that's a, our, um, the time we first met was, uh, yeah, in the, in the early, very early 1990s. And, um, you know, that was my first production design job back then. And um, I think it's about her second feature film that she'd done. So a um, long time back. And, uh, you know, we, we got on very well. Uh, I didn't I didn't move on with her to the piano or anything like that. I was kind of on other things. And um, yeah, and then uh, she, just sort of out of the blue, really, um, Jane is a, a New Zealander and she mm -hmm. resides in New Zealand and Australia. She she um, had um, contacts with Seesaw Pictures, uh, Seesaw Productions that have um, done some business in New Zealand before. So anyway, I was contacted by Seesaw Films, asked if I was wanted, interested to work in with uh, Jane Campion again. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, of course I am. And, um, uh, but that wasn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily get the job. You know, Jane is very, very um, cautious at the people she gets around her. Um, really, you know, from a creative point of view. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, we had a good long talk after I'd read the script again. And, and uh, you know, she sort of built her team, her creative team that she could have around her. And uh, I was part of that. So extremely pleased to be uh, working again with such a talented, intelligent person. So, you know, I didn't need to be asked twice, essentially. <laughs> So um, for you, what, what were the, the challenges of, of working on what I would consider to be quite a large scale location, but, but a quite an intimate story? Yeah, well, look, um, it struck me, you know, when I was uh, from a, the time I first read the script, that it's quite, got quite a lot of classic filmmaking things about it. It wasn't some big science fiction thing or period, uh, like ancient period thing where it was, a, a massive kind of, um, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries of, of mm. design and all that sort of stuff. It was really, the core of it was just the intimacies and the accuracy and the sort of fidelity that we wanted to have to the book and, and the period and the place. Yeah. So, you know, that was, to me, was the, the main sort of par parameters for it. Um, that it was on a, um, you know, on a big open location sort of um, Montana landscape was a really interesting thing for me. I mean, I hadn't really, I hadn't done any um, cowboy films at all. I mean, this is sort of late cowboy, you could say 1920s, 1925 is quite late cowboy, but it's got a beautiful sort of transition time between, you know, uh, guys on horses and cars, you know, cars and trucks and things like that. So it's a nice sort of beautiful time period. But um, yeah, it was, uh, there's a, obviously a lot of practicalities involved with um, uh, being able to make all these, make the environment, make the farm, basically, mm -hmm. the Burbank Ranch um, on a piece of bare ground. And, um, you know, there's a lot of logistics and engineering and mm -hmm. um, sort of, uh, yeah, a lot of risk involved in doing that. But it was, to me, Going back to your original question, it was quite a, um, in a way, it was sort of standard filmmaking, but on a fairly large scale for mm. me. You know, having there were big sets, there was a big commitment commitment from us. Yeah. But at the same time, it wasn't a big Marvel show with you know endless amount of money to spend. So we were we had to be very careful and concise with what we committed to. And uh, yeah. So I was going to say, um, how important was it for you um, to? give these characters a sense of legacy um, and sort of ground them in the story, which is sort of a, an expansion on, on your previous point. Yes, indeed. Yeah, well, look, um, the script is based on the book by mm -hmm. Thomas Savage. Um, the book uh, um, is a broader kind of timescale than mm -hmm. the, in the story. It starts earlier and sets up the world of the Burbanks and, um, and the farm and, and of Rose and Peter and their sort of um, journey that they take to get to what is the beginning of our film. Yeah. So that's great for me because it gives all this perspective and, and um, back history to 
what how this how the story begins so, mm. so um you know the the burbanks themselves have um the, the parents have emigrated from the eastern states out to this new enterprise out in yeah. out in uh montana you know we're gonna we're gonna be gentlemen ranchers and we're gonna build a big house and we're gonna be the social center of the of the whole scene there and 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 uh we're gonna build a big house and and so they brought they bought their their sort of east coast aesthetics and their and their east coast sort of ways of doing things um mm. out into this kind of wilderness area really and yeah, yeah. um you know bought the land and plonk, plonk this house there and so we really really wanted to sort of tell that story that like this this um, piece of piece of uh, east, east coast sort of aesthetic that's um, put on the middle of a sort of a fairly barren piece of land and the, the sort of dried out grasslands of Montana. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, yeah, the, the uh, likewise with the the town of Beach, um, you know, that's a that was a it's a railway town, and you know, back back in the day, you know, with, with the height of the railway kind of industry in in, Amer in America, there was just towns. Um, to service ranches all over the place. Some of them uh, were successful and grew into larger places. Some of them sort of died out, you know. And I, yeah, sure. I think Beach, I'd like to think that Beach probably is a ghost town now, you know. So it's, it's like, it's a kind of a, um, uh, not very many um, uh, people were there, but somehow or other, um, Rose and her and her husband, who had who had um, committed suicide there, you know, through mm. alcoholism and, and despair, I suppose, had sort of abandoned them really to their fate. And and uh, Rose and Peter had taken over the the um, the red mill and turned it into this restaurant to sort of make a living out there. Mm. Peter, um, he was a uh, the husband was a doctor, so Peter has has um, aspirations to follow in his father's footsteps for that. So it's a beautiful kind of a thing to. Um, you know, to sort of tell that sort of backstory through all the subtleties we can with the production design and, um, you know, arrive at the sort of story, you know, where the main story sort of kicks off. Yeah. I was going to say, um, expanding on that slightly, um, how how uh, intrinsic was the, the creation of the mansion? Because it, it feels such a, a solid thing in terms of the world building um, that obviously you undertook during the production. Yeah, well, look, I was tremendously fortunate to be able to build the house. Um, uh, originally, the production wanted me to find a place, to find a find a ranch or a farm, yeah, sure. and yeah. um, convert the building or whatever. But it would never ever have been as um, as good a end result, you know. That be able to be uh, to be able to create something from scratch was a gift, and uh, so Jane and I were able to dial up exactly the um flavor of the house you know what, this, what its style was what its shape was what the the geography of the inside and the outside was as it mm. related to other farm buildings and things like that so we 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 began with almost an empty slate there was actually a the the, the farm that we used was a uh, sheep and cattle farm uh so there was actually a shearing shed that was on the property which we covered over and it becomes one of the sort of peripheral um buildings on the on the on the, uh, on the for the ranch but we did do all of our own cattle yards we did the, the, our own um, barn um, cowboys quarters an old defunct tennis court and of course the house itself yeah, and sure. so you know we wanted the house to be big boned and um, we, we managed to build the first two stories of it the the peaked roofs and the chimneys and things like that were added in with CGI mm. after this um, yeah, yeah. just Step too far for us, um, and then all the um, then all the interiors were built on the stage. So um, it was a, actually quite a challenge because the farm itself was in a very very windy valley mm. in the central Otago, which was uh, sort of lower middle to lower area of the South Island in New Zealand. Um, and so uh, yeah, we had to have it all engineered, of course, and uh, we we the, the crew uh, suffered some pretty amazing. Storms and wind and sleet and snow as they were building this thing. So it was quite a, an epic journey, you know, to get it built. But I think in a way it sort of comes out in the quality of the of the uh, set itself. You know, it's, it's got this great weathered, wind beaten kind of quality to it, which is great. I would I would I would hazard a guess to say um, that the the landscape and the conjunction of of the sets and, and the mansion. Um, 
add a lot a great deal more to the film in, in fact i'd go so far as to to say that i think it represents maybe a, another character within the film to what extent do you think you agree with that oh yeah i do absolutely agree with that um you know the house is a um as i described it's sort of uh origins but mm. the family's abandoned the house or should i say the parents have abandoned the house to the kids and yeah, imagine sure. they would have been like 20 when they when they first Got, got this place. And now 20 years further on, mm. they have um, the, their life is sort of atrophied. So mm. they still sleep in the same bedroom that they did with our kids and, and little single beds side by side. Mm. Um, but the house itself is very much under the thumb of Phil Burbank. He's the dominant masculine presence there. Mm. Nothing happens around that place without his okay. And so it's, and, and he himself has, you know, in a way, he's a slightly haunted character. You know, he, he's had a sort of a big moment in his life with Bronco Henry mm. 30 years before. And, um, you know, he, he's, he's um, yeah, he, he's sort of leading a fairly empty existence. In fact, everybody is really, but, you know, Phil is definitely, that's his place. And it's got a sort of a darkness to it. You know, the darkness in the soul, I suppose, is yeah. synonymous with the darkness inside the house. It's also really emptied out. The house is, it's not very much furniture for the size of the rooms. Um, sort of the the mausoleum took, almost. Yeah, the parents took a lot of the furniture with them and they've sort of, but they, the kids have never, you know, they're not designers or anything mm. like that. They're just like farmers. So they, um, they just live in it kind of pretty much as it was when the parents left. But of course, Phil himself is actually very educated and uh, he's, he's quite articulate and, um, uh, you know, he has a lot of craft skills and things like that. So he's done his own um, taxidermy and he makes his own little furniture to give to for, uh, to George. And so, you know, he's a very complex character and we really wanted to play that, you know, give that sense in, the, in his environment. Yeah, it, well. it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting juxtaposition because obviously when he's first introduced, he comes across as quite a, quite a roughneck. And then it's the little little things with the handwriting and as you say the the furniture. Um, in terms of the material itself, um, what do you, what were the advantages for you personally of having a, a writer director on this project as opposed to um, other projects you may have been part of? Mm. Yeah, well, look, when I um, arrived uh, in, uh, on the show and just started off with Jane, mm. she had spent a lot of time on the script and the script was pretty much a lock off, you know, that's what it's going to be, notwithstanding some pressures for compromise for budget and things like that. Mm. She didn't compromise at all in the end. And um, she's also very clear headed and knew all the, um, not just the words on the page, of course, but all the psychological interactions and the the style of the, of the visuals and things like that. She had that very firmly in her head to start off with. So, you know, big respect for her for not leaving anything to, to chance. That's not to say that there wasn't a lot of, um, um, we had to work through a lot of creative things to, um, to make them real. You know, mm. this is all very well having these ideas in, in one's head and on the, on, you know, on the script page, but the actual practicality, excuse me, the practicalities of being able to um, actually build a set, um, you know, what are the camera angles that we wanted to, to play out here? Um, and things like that but you know she's a um, and it really does come out in the story you know that's a very clearly thought out story and very clearly thought out situation and all these sort of interactions are um, were known right from the word go and it, that's a really really good for a production designer. I was going to say um, obviously you, you've worked with Jane as you, you said previously um, also Nikki Caro you worked with with her prior to working on on Mulan and obviously you've worked with Peter a, a great many times on some big stuff. Um, for you now, is it is it the person that attracts you to the project or is it the story that they bring with them? Um, I would like to say it's the former, most of all. You know, it's really, really great to, co to collaborate with some of the best directors around. And, mm. um, you know, uh, they always bring quality to, to the show. At the same time, I do like to work on shows that ultimately I'll pay money to go and see in the cinema. You know, yeah. personally, I'm not so interested in the shoot 'em up kind of um, violent films and things mm. like that. Um, I'm particularly attracted to the sort of fine art of cinema. 
you know, mm. um, uh, it's all more, almost like classical music. And I, <laughs> I do, uh, I, even from right from the word go, I've sort of gravitated towards that, that sort of um, quality drama. So yeah, um, I'm particularly fortunate in such a small country, actually, to be able to have worked with um, some of the countries and some of the world's best. So, you know, very pleased with that. Thank you very much. Um, I've got one final question, which is completely off topic, Grant, and I ask everybody I talk to. Can you describe for me your perfect Sunday afternoon? Okay, brilliant. Good question. Um, well, look, where I live has got some awesome beaches, and mm. they are wild beaches, wild. Um, we, it's on the west coast of, of the city, mm. um, with the sea pounding away and the high winds and big rocky, craggy rocks all around. I like to be able to drive my classic car, I've got an old Ford Thunderbird, out to the beach with a couple of friends and a couple of beers and sit on the beach and uh, or go for a walk down the beach, actually. That's probably the best. So clears your head of all the cobwebs from the weeks of week work, weeks work, yeah. 